what must I do to inherit eternal life? The theme of our camp meeting, as you can see, is uh, the plan of salvation. So I thought a good topic to study is, well, what must I do to be saved? Don't you think that's a valid question? That's a good question, isn't it? As a matter of fact, as, as far as I know, every human being asks this question at a certain or a certain point in their life. Even atheists, even atheists ask this question, but they ask it in a different way. They ask it in a way that, well, what can we do not to die? Or what can we eat so we prolong our life? What are they after? They are after eternal life in their own way, right? <clears throat> Every human being seeks after eternal life. But my question is related to Christians this afternoon. What must we do to inherit or to have eternal life? Some say keep the, the law. Some say join this church. Some say well just say this prayer and that's it and you'll be saved. What I want us to do this afternoon is look at the scriptures and see what the scriptures says. As far as I find, this question has been asked only four times in the New Testament. Four times this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, what has been asked. So what I want us to do is look at those four different passages and see what they say and what we can learn from them. Do you think that's fair? That's good? All right. <clears throat> so our first passage is taken from a story when Jesus was talking to a man um, who's a rich young ruler. It's taken from Matthew 19, beginning at verse 16. And it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? There you go. That's the question that we want an answer for. And he that is Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, Keep the commandments. There you go. Jesus said, if you want eternal life, what do you do? Keep the commandments, right? Well, at least that's what some people say. He, the man, saith unto him, which, which commandment are you telling me to keep, Lord? <clears throat> Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? Why did Jesus tell the man to keep the commandments? The man came asking Jesus, What can I do to inherit eternal life, right? So Jesus told him, Keep the commandments. So is it wrong for me to tell you, If you want eternal life, you need to keep the commandments? I mean, Jesus said it, right? Well, we need to understand why did Jesus say what he say? Why is Jesus telling the man the words that we read? If you want eternal life, you can attain to eternal life by keeping the commandments. Can I attain to eternal life? Can I earn eternal life by obeying the law? No. Then why did Jesus tell him keep the law? You see, Jesus knew the heart of this man. He knew that this man is a law keeper. He knew that this man is coming to him and he's basing his assurance of eternal life. He's basing on his, his um, approval of even coming to ask this question on his obedience. Now, how could Jesus lead this man to where he want him to be? The way I understand it is Jesus met the man where the man is. So he can take him to where he want him to be. The man is, keep, is a keeper of the law. He thinks he's been keeping the law. So Jesus said, okay, let's take this out of the way first. What can you do to inherit the law? Keep the law. Well, I've done all this from my youth. Oh, okay. So you've been keeping the law all this, all from your youth, but your keeping of the law did not satisfy you. Your keeping of the law did not give you assurance of eternal life. Your keeping of the law, or in spite of your keeping the law, you are still seeking for eternal life. You with me? Jesus met the man where the man was so he can lead him where he wants him to be. I believe Jesus told him, keep the law so he can take the law out of the way because the man is, is, is basing his assurance or eternal life on his obedience. So Jesus met him there. He says, okay, keep the law. Well, I've done all this. Okay, you've done it all. And you're still seeking for eternal life, right? Yeah. Well, what do I still lack? The man asked Jesus. 
And then Jesus told him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. What law says, sell all what you have and give to the poor? No law. No law. There's no law in the Old Testament that says sell all what you have and give to the poor. Jesus was simply highlighting or pointing the man to the love of God being manifested in his heart. So the answer to the man's question, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? Is it keep the law or is it sell what you have and follow me? Which one of these two is the real answer that Jesus wanted to tell the man? The real answer to the man's question is, follow me. But Jesus couldn't tell him, follow me, without first letting him know, pointing his attention, that what you're counting, what you're basing your eternal life on, keeping the law, is not sufficient. The fact that you're coming and asking me says in itself that you're not, you don't have confidence of your eternal life, although you're a keeper of the law. That tells you that your keeping of the law doesn't earn you eternal life. Now, if you want eternal life, come and follow me. Yeah? Jesus pointed the man to a greater law, to the law of love. Let the love of God flow through your heart. What is the purpose of the law? The Ten Commandments. What's the purpose of the Ten Commandments? What is it? Point you to Christ. Point you to Christ, okay. But, but, but I'm, I'm looking, that, that's correct, that's true. But I'm looking in a different direction. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is love. What God was, if God is to speak the law to people or, or different words, He will say, I want you to manifest my love to your neighbor by not lying to him. I want you to manifest my love to your neighbor by not coveting his wife. I want you to manifest your love for me by keeping the Sabbath, and so forth. Right? Isn't this what Paul said? The whole law hangs on one word, which is love. The real purpose of the law is love. But because the people back then at Mount Sinai were slaves and could not understand the way God wanted to talk to them, he had to deal with them through laws and rules, right? But the, but the real purpose is what God wanted them to manifest, his love. And he told them, I want you to manifest my love this way, this way, this way. He put it in frames of laws and rules with consequences and punishments because he was dealing with children. You with me? So back to our question. When this man asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The real answer is, sell what you have and come and follow me. Jesus didn't even bother telling the man, oh yeah, you think you're keeping the law, but you're not really keeping the law because there is this law and there is this. He didn't bother going down that road. He met him where he is and then he pointed him to where he wants him to be. Come and follow me. Stop looking to the law and start looking to me. That's what Jesus was answering the man. Yeah, that's the first time this question is asked in the scripture. The second time is, uh, well, actually, no, we'll keep reading. The disciples, it says, and when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? I mean, you have to, to look at it from their perspective. At their time, if you're a descendant of Abraham, you're a Jew, and you're wealthy, and you are healthy, I mean, surely, surely God is smiling at you. Wealth and health was looked upon as blessings from God. So if you're a Jew and you're healthy and you're wealthy, man alive, you, you can't top that. that that's, that's, that's the best qualification to have eternal life. And when the disciples saw this rich young ruler, healthy and wealthy and obedient, coming to Jesus and going away sorrowful, the disciples said, oh my. If this rich, young, healthy, wealthy man can't be saved, who can? Notice what Jesus said. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. 
This verse alone tells you that there is nothing you can do of your own effort that will make you inherit eternal life. With man, it is impossible. Man cannot achieve it. Man can't earn it. It is impossible. But with God, it is possible. That's why if you want eternal life, come and follow me. <coughs> Amen? Amen? All right. The second time this question was asked is when the lawyer came tempting Jesus. And we read it here in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 29. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? There's the question again. He that Jesus said unto him, what is written in the law? How read it thou? He didn't ask him, what do you read? He asked him, how do you read it? How do you understand what you read? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. But he, the man, willing to justify himself, son unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So here we see again this man, a similar situation. He's a law keeper. He's coming to Jesus, asking him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And we find the conversation is turned towards obedience. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. This answer was better than the one before it because it's focused on love. Jesus said, okay, you've answered right. Now go do it. Go do it and you will live. But when Jesus told him to go do it, the man felt condemned. That's why he's willing to justify himself. He said, well, who is my neighbor? If I don't know who my neighbor is, well, I don't have to love him as myself. Well, then I have an excuse, right? You see, the problem is not in the works. The problem is not in the obedience. The problem is in the heart. This man had a heart problem. He could have figured at himself who his neighbor is, but he's using the law, he's using the letter of the law as an excuse not to do what God wanted him to do because his heart is not right. Yeah? So I believe Jesus gave him a parable, uh, the Good Samaritan, as an answer to both questions. What must I do to be saved? And who is my neighbor? I believe Jesus answered both questions in this parable. And I'll show you what, what I mean. Now the story is that this man coming down from Jerusalem, he's a Jew going to Jericho, I believe it was. And some thieves jumped on him. They beat him and they left him, left him half dead, right? And we pick up the story and it says, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. <clears throat> And likewise a Levi, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And the story goes on to say that he took him, put him in an inn, looked after him, and he paid money. And you know the story, right? Now notice what Jesus asked after he gave this parable. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor... Unto him that fell among the thieves. And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Now go and do thou likewise. What does Jesus mean by that? Depends how you understand the verse before it. Depends how you understand the parable. Remember, the man came asking Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus gave a story and then he said, who was neighbor unto him that was injured? You with me? Who is my neighbor? Jesus gave a parable and then he asked me, who was neighbor to you? What I'm trying to say is depending how you understand verse 36, you will understand verse 37. When Jesus said, go and do likewise, what did he mean? Did he mean, Go and do like the good Samaritan? Or did he mean, go and do like the injured man did? Jesus, uh, the man asked him, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, who was neighbor unto him or who was neighbor unto you? You with me? So in the parable, you can look at it two ways. 
One, Jesus told the man, go do like the Samaritan did. Go help everybody who needs help. Or the second one, Jesus put the man who's asking, he put him in the position of the injured man. And in the parable, Jesus was telling him, the priests can help you. The Levite can't help you. The only one who can help you is the one whom you are calling a Samaritan. Remember, it wasn't long before that, that the Jews called Jesus, surely thou art a Samaritan. So the way, the way that I would understand it, the man said, who is my neighbor? Jesus told him, well, okay, who was neighbor unto you? Or who was neighbor unto the injured man? Now go do like the injured man did. What did the injured man do? He received help from a Samaritan. So I believe Jesus was answering both, both questions in one parable and he was telling the man, if you want to have eternal life, receive help from the one whom you are calling a Samaritan. That's the only way you receive life is by letting me help you. You with me? He wasn't telling him, go and do good works. By doing good works and good humanitarian aid, you will have eternal life. So the real answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is it? Go do, go love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Go do some good humanitarian work or let me help you. Remember what uh, Paul said? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness. You will not inherit eternal life by fulfilling the commandment that says, love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus said, okay, I will fix up your problem. The only problem you have is you don't know who your neighbor is. If you know who your neighbor is, then you will go do humanitarian aid and you will inherit eternal life. That's not what Jesus meant. What Jesus was telling the man, if you want to have eternal life, let me help you. You can only receive help from me. Do you think this man, the Jew, who came asking Jesus for eternal life, do you think he would have asked a priest before? Do you think he would have asked a Levi before? What can I do to inherit eternal life? You can be sure he did. He's a Jew. He's been seeking for eternal life for who knows how long. And it's interesting, in the parable, Jesus told him the priest couldn't help. The Levi couldn't help. Stop looking to the law. Start looking to me. Your help will only come from one direction, and that is from me. You with me? So what's common between the two stories that we read? Both of them are law keepers. Both of them are seeking for eternal life. Both of them are depending or are basing their eternal life on their law keeping. And in both of them, Jesus pointed them to love, the love of God being shed abroad in your heart. One, sell what you have and follow me. And the second one is be humble enough to accept my love, to accept my help. The law was not, is not, will never ever be the way for eternal life. The law can save, the law cannot give you life. Jesus was simply pointing them to their heart problem. Selfishness versus love. An unconverted heart versus a converted heart. Paul said it very clear. Now remember, who taught Paul the gospel? Jesus. That's what he says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. He says, I did not learn it from any man. I learned it from Jesus himself. For three years, Jesus taught him. How? I don't know. But that's what Paul says. And he says in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The works of the law cannot justify you. The works of the law can't make you righteous. The works of the law can't earn you eternal life. So don't go understanding the words of Jesus to mean he's teaching the people to go looking to the law and the works of the law seeking for eternal life. It doesn't work. Jesus taught Paul the gospel and that's what Paul is saying. 
Going on in Galatians, Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Righteousness cannot come from the law. It cannot come from the works of the law. The law was not intended to make you righteous. The law was not intended to give you righteousness. That was never the purpose of the law. You with me? In chapter 3 of the same letter, he says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. What is Paul saying? He's saying God could not have given a law by which life could be given. That's one thing God couldn't do. So the works of the law can't make you just or righteous. The law itself cannot earn you righteousness and the law cannot give you life. Remember, Jesus taught Paul the gospel. So you can't go read this conversation between Jesus and the lawyer or Jesus and the rich young ruler and say, see, Jesus said, if you want life, keep the law. No, you're misunderstanding what he said because you make him contradict what Paul said, right? Jesus never intended to tell these people, if you want eternal life, go keep the law. That wasn't his intention. He was meeting them where they were to lead them where he wanted them to be. The law was never the way to eternal life. Yes, he told them keep the law so they can see their own weakness. Hello and welcome. Now, in both stories also, Jesus asked them to manifest their love in outward works. By saying that the law, the works of the law and the law can't earn you righteous, can't earn your life, that is true. But it doesn't mean you live a life out of harmony of the will of God. It doesn't work that, that way either. You with me? Jesus told them, go manifest your love by outward works. All right, moving on. The third time this question was asked, the first two times they were asked to Jesus directly. The third time... It was asked indirectly to Jesus. And we find it in John chapter 6. And we read in John chapter 6, beginning at verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him has God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Or what shall we do that we might eat of this bread that give us everlasting life? What shall we do that we might inherit eternal life? That's what they're asking indirectly. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. So this time Jesus answered directly. If you want eternal life, believe on him whom he has sent. Believe on Jesus and you will have eternal life. This is the only prerequisite to earning or sorry. This is the only prerequisite to having, to receiving eternal life. Just like he told the man with the Good Samaritan story. Let me help you <coughs> receive help. The fourth time this question was asked is not to Jesus, but to Paul and Silas. If you remember once Paul and Silas, they were uh, beaten and thrown in jail. And while in jail, at the middle of the night, they started singing hymns. There was an earthquake. The jails were open. The jailer came out. He saw the doors swung open. He was about to kill himself. Pulled his sword. He was going to kill himself. And suddenly Paul called and he said, Hey, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Right? And then we pick up the story. And it says in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, and brought them out, that's the jailer, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the question. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word, the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straight away. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. 
Now this was Paul. Paul, if we can say, is the author or the one, the man that Jesus used to expand upon righteousness by faith. And here is he's practicing what Jesus said and what he taught. The only condition to eternal life is you believing on Jesus. And here is a man coming to him and asking him, what, what can I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only you, you and your whole house will be saved. How, how, how easy and contagious is salvation? And the thing is, who, who was this jailer? He was a Roman jailer, right? He was a pagan. Don't miss the point. From paganism to the kingdom of his dear son in one night. The guy was baptized that night. How much doctrine do you think he understood? But according to Paul, the author of probably half the New Testament, well, I'm maybe exaggerating, but the author of the Righteous by Faith message, according to Paul, he was baptized the self-same night from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son in one night. And there was only one condition. Believe on the Lord and you will be saved. That is how easy it is to be saved. <clears throat> it did not depend on the man's works. It depended on what he believed, who he believed on. But uh, I just want to make it clear that it's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not preaching cheap grace. I'm not talking, saying, put your hand up, say one prayer, that's it, go home, continue life as normally you say, no, 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 no. If you were saved last year, you're saved today. It's not a one night thing. Notice what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if, is a condition, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. It's not a one day thing. Put your hand up, say a prayer, and that's it. No, 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 no. It starts in one day. Eternal life enters the minute you believe, but it's a continuous thing. You, you have to walk in that faith. You have to walk in that belief. Keep it in memory. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget what God has done for you. Don't forget what God has done in you. Every day, keep it in mind. Keep it in memory. Amen? See, Jesus finished the work of salvation. It's a finished work. It's not a work that is still open to be modified and, and improved upon. It's a, the work of salvation is a finished work. It's complete. Jesus said it is finished. It's a done deal. Now somebody will say, God, Jesus is ministering in the sanctuary of heaven. Yes, of course he is. But he's not adding to his work of salvation. He is ministering his life. He is ministering what he accomplished in his life, death and resurrection. Yes? But it's a finished work. And you receive eternal life by receiving Him. Jesus, the work of salvation is not found in me. The work of salvation is found in Him, in His life. He came and He fulfilled the will of God. He restored humanity to God. He reunited, He restored that relationship, but it was all found in Him. What the Lord could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Who condemned sin in the flesh? Me or Him? He did, not me. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. How will it be fulfilled in me? I didn't do anything. It will be fulfilled in me because I will receive His life. The work of salvation is a finished work, completed work found in the life of Christ. And it's given to me as a free gift. What must I do to be saved? I must receive Christ. I must believe on Him. Now there's one thing I want to highlight. So many times, we, how are we saved? By faith, right? We all say we're saved by faith, right? Wrong. Wrong. 
Notice what the Bible says. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us us together with Christ. When we were dead, he gave us life with Christ. <clears throat> by grace, ye are saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. We're not saved by faith. We're saved by grace through faith. Why am I highlighting it? it, it because it does make a difference. In our practical everyday walk, it does make a difference. We have the tendency to want to do something. And usually when we begin our Christian walk, we want to obey. We want to do the law thinking that by doing it, we will earn. And then we learn the righteousness by faith. And we, we transfer that mentality from our works to our faith. You don't earn salvation by your faith. You're saved by grace, through faith. But don't forget that salvation is by the grace of God. It doesn't matter how, far, how much faith you have, you don't earn salvation. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Doesn't matter how good I will be. Doesn't matter how much I obey. Doesn't matter how much I believe. I don't deserve it. It's only by His grace and goodness and love that He gives it to me for free. You with me? Tom missed the point. It is by grace that you are saved out of his love for you and for me that he offered us eternal life for free. He, he says also, Paul says in Romans, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace. Don't miss the point, freely. It's free. Why? Because of his grace. You're freely, it's freely given through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. God has freely offered salvation to the human race. It is freely given to, to everybody who wants it. All right, so the question that I ask myself, and I'm putting to us today, is all right. Well, if salvation is not by faith, it is by grace, as you're highlighting and the man you're quoting Paul is saying, then why do I need faith? Right? If it is by grace, freely given to everyone, then why do I need faith? That's a valid question. What is faith? Believing? Having confidence? Trusting? <clears throat> Faith, how, how do I illustrate faith? Faith is standing strong regardless what temptation comes my way. Regardless what, what uh, attacks the devil brings. Faith is standing there and knowing or saying with Paul, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. Faith is knowing that he hears me. Faith is knowing that he's got my back. Faith is knowing that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Faith is knowing that even if I die, he will raise me up. Faith is knowing that even if I'm persecuted, I'm not cast down, I'm not forsaken. It is knowing that even if I'm cast down, I will not be destroyed. Faith is knowing who I am. What is faith? Faith is a word we use to describe a relationship that I have with God. That is what faith means. It's just a word we use to describe that relationship. Relationship of confidence, of believing Him. So why do I need faith? <clears throat> why do I need to trust? You know that trust is the issue? If you think about it, the first sin of the human race, what was it? Eve, in the Garden of Eden, in front of that tree, what was the problem? It wasn't eating of the fruit. The problem is that she stopped trusting the Word of God. If you eat, you will die. And she trusted the Word of Satan. Oh, the Bible says, after she heard what Satan said, she said, when she saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to make one wise. What? 
Just two verses earlier, you said, if we eat of it, we will die. But suddenly her mind changes when she believed the word of Satan and she trusted the word of Satan. And now her outlook on the tree, the way she saw the tree changed. And she started seeing it the way Satan wanted her to see it. So the first issue is trust, which we call a broken relationship. So what did God do? In His Son, Jesus, God restored life to the human race. God brought, re restored uh, that relationship between humanity and divinity. It's been restored in Jesus Christ. It's all been done. It's an accomplished work. It's a done deal. And God gives it to you and He says, Are you going to trust me? What, what, what did Abraham do? What does Paul say in Romans 4? What did Abraham believe? Abraham believed that what God has promised, he or God was able to do. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. All what Abraham did is he believed, all right, Lord, you said that you go, I'm going to have a child. So I believe that you are able to give me a child. That's it. That's enough for me, God says. You trust me. God was counted unto him for righteousness. So what I'm saying is this. God did the whole Thing. Jesus accomplished the work of salvation, is accomplished deal, and the same test comes to you and me today. And the question is, will you trust me? Will you trust me that I can save you and I've already saved me? Will you trust my word when I say that you are a new creature in my son? Will you trust me? Who are you going to make your fortress and your defense? <clears throat> Yourself? Your work? Your understanding or me? That is the real issue. That is why <clears throat> though salvation is offered by grace for free, we receive it through faith. Because faith turns this, this uh, collective theology into a personal practical reality. Faith is what turns God's will, is what turns God's will for me into God's will in me. You with me? Faith is that relationship where I trust God. I believe His word. I know that He's able to do it in me. And I know he, that He has already done it in me. That's why Jesus said, the work of God is that you believe on Him whom He has sent. I just want you to trust me. I just want you to rest in me. You with me? Salvation is by grace, freely given to everyone. And I can reach out and grab it by faith, meaning by simply believing it. And trusting. Now, there is, it's not just as simple as I explained it. There is a supernatural element to it that when you believe, something supernaturally happens inside of you, right? That part I can't explain, but the Bible calls it, you will be born again. A new heart and a new mind, a new life is given to you. The life of Jesus Christ comes inside of you. I can't explain that. I just believe it because the Bible says so, right? I've chosen to trust Him and trust what His Word says. So when you believe, you turn this collective theology into a personal practical reality by faith. That's why you're saved by grace through faith. Because your faith is what grabs all of it. Your faith is what makes it personal and it allows your mind to be changed because the problem between us and God is not in God's mind, it is in my mind. <clears throat> All what God, I believe, is saying is, do you believe that I have saved you? Do you believe that I have given you my righteousness? That is why I think it is impossible to have that kind of faith, that kind of relationship with God, and at the same time, doubt whether you are saved or not. It doesn't work. It's an oxymoron. 
If you have that faith in God, if you have that relationship with Him, why are you doubting your salvation? Are you doubting that He's able to save you? Are you doubting what He said? Are you doubting that He has given you His righteousness? Are you doubting that He has given you the life of His Son? If you believe this part, how can you not believe that you are saved in Christ? Not without Christ. Don't mis misunderstand me. You can't. You can't. You are either saved or you're lost. There's no third option. <clears throat> now, I believe that the problem we have is we don't understand the love that God has for us. How the earlier was talking about the love of God being part of his family. And I think we undermine the love of God. And because we undermine it, we don't understand what he has done for us. So I, I want to close with just a story that God has given in his word that highlights his love. I'm going to spice it and pepper it a bit just so I can bring it to real life, right? Because it, it was a real life scenario. And the story is taken from Hosea, the book of Hosea. You, you familiar with the book of Hosea? And here is this man living his life. He's happy. He's faithful. He believes. And suddenly God appears to him at nighttime, daytime. I don't know. He says, Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. What? I want you to go and marry a prostitute. And I want you to love her. <laughs> okay, Lord, I'll go. So he goes. He finds a woman by the name of Gomar. He brings her home. He marries her. He has three children with her. And then she decides she wants to go back to prostitution. I've had enough with this guy. I'm going back. So she goes back to prostitution. I don't know. Probably Hosea says, she's gone. But then God appears to him again and says, Hosea, I want you to go find her again. And I want you to love her. Take that if you can. So the man says, okay, all right, Lord, I'll go. Now here is this righteous, holy man Walking in the streets where no godly man is ought to be found. Don't forget, he's looking for a prostitute. He's not going to find a prostitute in the synagogue, right? He's going to go where the prostitutes are, where they, where they sell prostitutes. That's where he's going to look for his wife. And he's walking down the streets where no godly man... I mean, just his presence there is humiliating enough. But he goes there and he gets to the corner there where, where, where they sell prostitutes. And he looks around and he sees his wife on display. And um, probably he says something like, uh, excuse me, sir, that's my wife. And I don't know, but probably the man says, I don't care even if she was your mother. You want her, you pay her price. Now, I, 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 want, you, I want you to picture the humiliation and degradation this man is feeling right now. We're talking about a culture that if a woman cheated on her husband, she is to be stoned to death. The man was everything. His dignity, his pride was everything. And here he is standing now in this scene where his wife is up there. The man probably said whatever he said to him. And the street is full of people and everybody's looking at this holy man coming to fetch his prostitute wife. And God told Hosea, I want you to do this, that you might show my love for Israel. And probably Hosea is standing there and, 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 and he takes a few minutes to, to muster the courage uh, and the breath to, to be able to speak. And, and probably he asks, how much? How much do you want me to pay for my wife? What do you want me to pay in order to get back what is mine? And the Bible says he pays one and a half omar of, uh, of barley and uh, 15 pieces of silver. And he takes her home and he's meant to love her. Now God said, Hosea, I want you to do this, that you might show my love for you, for Israel. Now imagine on the way back, Gomer looks at Hosea and says, all right, Hosea, what can I, what can I do to be your wife? What, what can I do to get you to love me? What's wrong with you? Haven't you seen what I just did for you? Haven't you seen what I've been through for you? You didn't choose me. I chose you. 
You didn't come after me. I came after you. You didn't pay to be with me. I paid to buy you. That's what we're doing to God every time you doubt what He has done for you. What, what, what can I do to inherit eternal life? What? What law should I obey to inherit eternal life? What? Don't you understand what I've done for you? On the cross, how much? How much do I need to pay in order to get you back? He paid with his own life to get back what was originally his. Because we don't understand the love by which God loved us, we misunderstand how freely salvation is given. He saved us before we even thought about it. He gave us eternal life before we even knew about eternal life. He forgave us our sins before we knew what sin is. All what he's saying is, son, daughter, will you believe me? Will you trust me? Will you let me change you? Will you let me give you the life of my son? So what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is the plan of salvation? Is you receiving the life of the Son of God for free? How do you get that? By faith or simply by trusting, by believing. Believing that He didn't save the human race, He saved me. He didn't give eternal life to everybody, He gave eternal life to me. By make it personal, it's me. That is what faith is. That is what belief is. It's trusting what He said and having that close relationship with Him. Amen? All right, we'll close with the word of prayer and we'll leave it at that. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the free salvation that you have given us in your Son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for the free life of your Son that you have given to us freely. Lord, I pray that you will help our unbelief. Lord, where there is doubt in our heart, I pray that you replace it with faith. Where there is unbelief, I pray that you replace it with belief. Father, help us to believe what your word says about us. Help us to believe who we are in your eyes, what we have in you and in your son Jesus, that we might live this life that you have for us and bring glory to your name. This is my prayer in the precious name of your son Jesus. Amen.